Okay, um, so today, and actually I've got some time to work through a few example problems today. I, I wanna finish up uh, uh, single sideband modulation. We'll talk about uh, transmitter and receiver. The receiver is actually pretty simple. The transmitter is pretty simple based on the equations that we had last time. Uh, and then I also wanna talk about frequency translation or fre frequency mixer. And uh, the frequency mixer, it's, it's actually pretty simple in operation, um, but it's a fundamental component in what's known as a superheterodyne receiver. Okay. And the superheterodyne technique, what a great name, superheterodyne. Heterodyning is another term for mixing or frequency shifting. Uh, another term for really multiplication, okay. But the superheterodyne receiver is used in almost all modern communication receivers, okay. Um, you guys have probably never seen really old uh, AM radios, but typically they'd have three tuning knobs. So in order to pick the station that you wanted to listen to, you would, you would kind of adjust maybe a corner frequency by adjusting a capacitor of like a low pass filter and a high pass filter to get a band pass filter around the station one. And you know, it could take you 15 minutes to tune in the radio you wanted to listen to. Um, the super heterodyne technique um, eliminates that. You really have just um, one tuner and you're not actually adjusting the corner frequency of a bandpass filter, you're actually adjusting the oscillation frequency of an oscillator. And so we'll see how that works. What it does is it essentially translates every radio station to one frequency, and then we envelope detect at that frequency instead of having to envelope detect at all these different frequencies. But the same technique is, is used in FM receivers, it's used in television, and we'll talk about the advantages of it, but, um, oh, let's see, do you need this down to see me? You do? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, I don't know if any of it's read, readable anyway, so, but hope, with your notes, I appreciate everyone sending me the notes, by the way. So I, I try to put them all up there that I get. Um, so single sideband modulation. Oh, one thing before I start. So I uh, started working on the spring schedule of classes. So uh, one elective that we, always offer in the spring is Dr. Lutfalian teaches one on, I think, uh, industrial electronics. Uh, so it's, it's a popular elective. So we always offer that. It's 445. Um, you have some other choices. We try to offer two electives in the electrical engineering department. Okay. Uh, so, but, you know, other choices would be you know, um, math, physics, computer science classes that you could take as, as electives. Um, computer science 215, it's the second programming course after 210. Have some students interested in that occasionally. Um, dynamics in the mechanical engineering department is another option that you can take as an elective. Actually, you guys need to take three electives, right? Uh, you have to replace what was optics in the catalog. Um, uh, but we do try to offer another ele EE elective. Okay, uh, so it looks like I, I'm the only one who has room in my schedule to teach an elective. So I'll probably be putting up some sort of poll to see what class that you would like. Um, what I could do is uh, I've taught an image processing class in the past. Um, which has a little bit of, of programming and it's MATLAB programming. So you, you become better MATLAB programmers and it, it's really an applied version of uh, 311, but it's, it's a lot different than, than 311. The algorithms are simpler. 
but it, it's pretty impressive because it is an applied course. You, you see the results of you know doing these filtering filtering operations on images. Another class I've taught in the past, I uh, used to teach it quite often, is um, it's um, analog, it's called analog design. It's really design of analog filters. So, you know, 311 concentrates on design of digital filters. And, um, but uh, this is uh, design of analog filters, like how do you design actual Butterworth filters? And, you know, um, we'll look at Chevy Chubb filters. It's, you know, a bit more, um, mathematical kind of, um, there's a lot of LT spice simulation involved in that. Um, I've also taught a class in, uh, uh, communication circuits, you know, looking at the, the circuitry that are, um, is used in, in, uh, radios and things like that. Um, Again, that's doing some some high frequency stuff. Again, a little bit of LT spice simulation. Um, um, if there's a particular topic area you're really interested in, I might consider teaching a class. But you know, kind of what we need is to offer the class is maybe. I mean, it's a small group, but you know, four or five people to to express interest in order to be able to offer an elective. Other, otherwise, they won't allow me to teach it. Um, but I'll, uh, you know, put up a poll and see see what kind of response. But what you probably want to do is, you know, get together and, and discuss. Um, well, this is, you know, if the poll is one person and four different areas, then, you know, we won't be offering an elective. So, um, you know, look at the polls, see what the options are, and then uh, um, discuss what you might like to take. Okay. Again, you, you don't have to take, you could take dynamics or CS215 or physics class or something like that. The, the other thing is, I guess, uh, uh, because of uh, Dr. Blandford's death, um, I'm going to be teaching 311. So, and we're, we're actually modifying our curriculum. What, what was EE 471, which is a required class for you guys in the spring, will actually be a free elective for you. Okay, so, and by free elective, I don't mean a technical elective. We're modifying the curriculum so that actually becomes a completely free elective. We, we don't have any free electives in our program, which is a bit unusual, but that means you can take any course that you want to. Um, you know, maybe, um, you know, course you've already taken can count as that, can count as that free elective as well. You know, as long as it, you can't double count a course, but if you've taken some course in the in the past that um, didn't fit in fit into one of the slots that are in our program, you could count that actually as this as this free elective class. So, um, any questions about any of that? Okay. So, for example, if if you took FYS 111, that that could count as your free elective. So, F. FYS 112 is required and FYS 111 doesn't even count in toward the engineering degree, but it would count as a free elective. So, or you could take, you know, another engineering course or a math class or something like that, or physics or music or theater or whatever you want to. Okay. Um, single sideband modulation. So, we had this expression for this mathematical expression. And I think I was actually writing a, a tilde last time for the Hilbert trans transform, but he uses a caret in the textbook. And I think it's just a matter of, I couldn't read my own notes last time. And so I was reading it as a, as a tilde, but it's actually a, a caret. C A R E T, not not the orange kind. Um, F C of T, um, and that's the time domain expression. So a little s, and then the frequency domain. Oops. 
we had, I think it was AC over four, M, F minus FC, one plus signum, F minus FC. And, and you remember, this is actually just a unit step that shifted to the, to the right, okay, and would pass through the upper sideband while eliminating the lower sideband. That's, that's all that is. And then we also have, have to do the same thing in the negative frequency axis, one minus signum of F plus FC. Okay. So it leads from the mathematical expressions, it leads directly to the, the two common single sideband modulation methods. Uh, one is based on the time domain expression where that's supposed to be a negative 90 degrees. Remember uh, to form the Hilbert transform signal, we just phase shift by 90 degrees at all frequencies, M of T to produce the Hilbert transform of the signal. Okay. Now Hilbert transform filters aren't easy to manufacture, design, uh, but they're actually relatively easy to do digitally. So one technique is actually do a A to D conversion, do the uh, Hilbert transform, and then do a D to A conversion to get M hat of T. Um, and then the math we need to do is multiplied by cosine. So we have this local oscillator at our transmitter, which is uh, AC cosine of two pi FC of T. So this generates that first term. Okay. And then in the second term, we multiply the Hilbert transform by Now that's the same block, negative 90 degrees, but this only has to do with the 90 degree phase shift at one frequency, at the carrier frequency, actually. So it's, this is called a narrow band phase shifter. It only has to work at one frequency versus a wide band phase shifter. So this one's a lot easier to manufacture. Actually, there are certain oscillator circuits that will produce both of those for you, the cosine and sine waveform. And sum these, got to subtract this one. And this would produce our upper sideband signal. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the math, but I think to get the lower sideband, you just add instead of subtract. The math, you look at your notes from last time. This is called the, uh, so single sideband modulation. This is called the phase discrimination method. Phase discrimin, that's not right. Discrimination. D-I-S-C-R-I-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N. -I -I Got a little too close to the board. The, the other method is based on doing this in the frequency domain, and it looks a lot simpler. We, we double sideband modulate. And then just bandpass filter around our upper sideband. to produce our upper sideband signal. And looks simpler, but again, you, you typically will need a, a pretty high quality bandpass filter in order to completely remove the lower sideband because those sidebands are right next to each other, okay? So this is called the frequency discrimination.
um, the demodulation is it does there is no you can't use envelope detection that that just will not work but it, so it requires synchronous demodulation but it's actually the same receiver as a double sideband receiver um, ac prime cosine of 2 pi fc of t And then actually, I don't think you need the, yeah, you do. And then low pass filter. And looking at what happens in the frequency domain where it's easy, easiest to figure out what's going on here. Here's our upper sideband signal. Here's our carrier frequency our carrier frequency. So this is in the frequency domain, what our spectrum looks like, you know, we've eliminated. So this is what's coming in. We multiply by our carrier. We know what that produces. It shifts the thing to the left by FC. So that means that this would be here. This one would be shifted down to minus two FC. Okay. We add to that, this picture shifted to the right by FC, right? That's what, that's what multiplication by cosine does. That's convolving with a pair of impulses, one at FC and one at minus FC. So we get this thing shifted to the, to the left and then shifted to the right. So again, up at two FC. And then that's my baseband spectrum. Remember with a double sideband, we actually got two of these that were added together at baseband. Okay, so the same receiver actually works for double side band modulation. Okay, so now I wanna talk about frequency mixing. And this is, again, it's <coughs> used in all modern communication receivers in some form or another. Uh, you know, we've I've kind of pretended to this point, at this point that, you know, to, to receive a particular AM radio station, you know, you kind of band pass filter around the one that you want and then run that through an envelope detector. And again, that would work. It was used originally, but that's not the method that's used in modern receivers. It uses a superheterodyne technique. It's, it's a great name, but it's actually not that complicated. It's a, it's a pretty neat technique. Uh, so it, we can change a carrier frequency by just mixing again, essentially multiplying uh, by a cosine again. So let's say we've got S1 of T coming in, it's a, it's, it's a modulated signal. So it is at some carrier frequency. And then we, this is FL, not FC, multiply by cosine. Now we've used this in our synchronous receivers where this, this was also FC. And it would, the result then would be down at baseband. But here, this is not equal to FC, okay? So it actually translates this signal to a new carrier. And that, that's all it does. And then we have to band pass filter, and you'll see why. We look at this in the frequency domain. And this produces then, <coughs> that modulated signal, but now at a different carrier frequency. So this thing has lots of applications. So um, it's called a frequency mixer is often how it's, um, what it's called. It's called a, uh, the other term you can hear is frequency heterodyning, heterodyning. 
would be another term for it. You'll hear both of those. So uh, if S1 of T has a carrier frequency of F1, then S2 of T will have a carrier frequency of F2 is equal to the absolute value of F1 plus or minus F2. And the absolute value can complicate things. It's, it's better to always think of it, I'm sorry, not F1 plus or minus F2, but F1 plus or minus FL, is what the output of the mixer always produces the sum and difference frequencies, okay? Now, in some cases, that difference might be negative, but then the absolute value, you know, would convert it into a positive frequency. But in some cases, the, both the sum and difference are both positive, okay? And that, that's actually fairly typical and the absolute value does nothing, okay? So, but what I, what I stress is just remember that this mixing always produces the sum and difference frequencies. And then the bandpass filter then passes through the one you're interested in, the frequency you're trying to get. And so we'll, we'll see how that uh, works. But let me, let me draw at least a, a picture here in the frequency domain. So let, let's say F1. So this is the carrier of S1 coming in. Okay. And then we know Let me call this S prime because our before our bandpass filter. So S prime of F, we know what it looks like. We know what multiplying by a cosine does, right? It just produces, there's this annoying factor of a half that keeps appearing, but it's one half the the spectrum shifted to the left. I keep wanting to put FC, this is FL in here now, okay. In the past, FL has been equal to F1 and it shifted all the way down to uh, baseband. But now in our applications, it's not. So FL is not equal to F1. So we get this thing shifted to the left at F. Now we'll get this, this will now be at F1 minus FL This would be at the negative of that, negative of F1 minus FL. Okay. That's this first part. And I'm leaving out the factors of one half that are scaling all the amplitudes. And then I get the thing shifted to the right. So F1 would be here in the middle, F1 plus FL. And then the negative of that, negative of F1 plus FL. Okay. The key difference between, again, this, this mixing and demodulation is that if, in demodulation, F1 is, F1 and FL are equal, and this difference one is always down, at, it would then be at baseband, and I would double it up for a double sideband receiver. So I guess what I, what I encourage you to do is, is think about all this thing does is produce sum and difference frequencies. If you can remember that, you'll be okay, okay? And there's a lots of different problems that you can solve, okay? So, but the other thing you have to learn to be an engineer is all the terminology, okay? And that can be actually one of the more difficult obstacles. It's, you're said to be doing down conversion if, The bandpass filter is centered at F1 minus FL. 
actually probably more simply than that, it's down conversion if the output frequency is less than the input frequency, okay. And so this isn't always quite true. And then up conversion if the output frequency is higher. Up conversion if bandpass filter is centered at F1 plus F2. And again, I don't think that's actually quite right. It's better to think if the output frequency is higher than the input frequency, it's up conversion. Okay. There's also something called low side and high side conversion, which we'll talk about as well. Okay. So example, okay. F1 is 10 megahertz. And FL is 100 megahertz. What are the possible values of F2? And then draw the spectra with assuming the bandwidth is 2 megahertz. Again, F1 is a carrier here um, of a modulated signal. So it has a wider bandwidth. This is a single frequency signal here, FL, the thing we're mixing with. Okay. So it, it's, it can be And then F1 is 10 megahertz. Of course, this would, this would still produce the right results, even if both of these were single frequency. But what this typically does is really change the carrier frequency of a modulated signal. So what are the carrier frequencies at the output of this thing? What are the, what are the, what's the sum of these two frequencies and what, what is the difference of these two frequencies? 90 and 110, it's that simple, okay. So actually 90 megahertz and 100 megahertz, and both are produced, okay. You then pick the one you want by filtering out the other one, okay. passing through the one you want with the bandpass filter. Okay, so, so the corresponding picture here again, both of these are actually up conversion. That's why I said this is not quite right. I guess it would be right if I put absolute value. No, it's not even right then. Because both of these are really up conversion because the output carrier is, is higher than the input carrier frequency. Okay. So the picture here, I did, thank you. Uh, 10 and minus 10. So we'll do this. So let's go 12 and 8. That's W is my baseband bandwidth. Okay. So the modulated bandwidth would be twice W. Okay. So this would go from minus, minus 12 to minus 8. Okay. So this is the S1 spectrum. Now I'm, I mix this with a hundred. Okay. So I shift this to the right by a hundred megahertz. So minus 10 plus a hundred would be 90. Minus uh, uh, plus 10 plus a hundred would be uh, 110. So this would now, um, I maintain the same distance between these two. It's still 20 megahertz. The bandwidth has not changed. This is now 112 and then 108. This is 92 and 88. Okay. So that's the shift to the right, shift it to the left. So I have minus 90, minus 110. Okay. 
the same frequencies there. So this would be, you know, the output of my mixer. Okay. Now, typically, we don't keep both of these. Okay. The, the problem here might be change the carrier frequency of this thing to 110 megahertz. Okay. In which case, I would then bandpass filter around the 110 to eliminate the other. Okay. I could use this same uh, uh, mixer to produce a carrier at 90. Okay. Um, I, I would just bandpass filter around the 90. Okay. So there are always two output frequencies. Okay. There are actually always two choices for any of these three. Okay. So let, let me turn this around. Let's say I gave you this problem. We've got 10 megahertz coming in. And I want to produce a 90 megahertz output. Okay. What are my two choices? There are always two choices. Okay. 80 and 100, right? We know the 100 works because that we just use that there, right? And then now the difference would be the 90. This would also produce a 110, but I'm going to bandpass filter around 90 here. So this would actually produce 90 and 110. The other choice is 80 megahertz which is going to produce 70, which is the difference, but it also produces the sum, which is 90. And then the same bandpass filter would produce my 90 megahertz output. Okay. You could use either one of these, okay. either the 80 or 100. Okay. You think it might be a little easier to actually uh, use the lower frequency. I mean, we've got to build an oscillator here that does this, but um, we'll see in some tuning applications, it's actually a little more uh, convenient to use uh, the higher frequency. Okay. Um, so both of these are up conversion. Okay. So let me just, instead of writing this on the board, let's say F1 is 60 and F2 is 80. So you want to go from 60 to 80. What's your local oscillator frequencies? Yeah, so 60 coming in. F, it's usually written FLO for local oscillator. And then we want 80. What are your choices? 20 and 140, right? The sum would be 80. The difference there would actually be, well, 40 megahertz, right? So, so it produces two, but then also, what was it, 140? If it were set to 140, the difference would be 80 and the sum would be 200. Okay, so again, there's always two choices. Um, more terminology. If FLO is less than F1, you're said to be doing low side conversion. And I'm not drawing the, the pictures here in the frequency domain, but I encourage you to do that, especially in the homework. And then if the local oscillator is greater than F1, it's called high side conversion.
Okay, let's let's do it this way. I'll pick some. AM radio frequencies. Um, do I remember the? Uh, someone look up on your phone the intermediate frequency for AM radio. Um, someone ha what's what's the? Intermediate frequency for AM radio. I'll know it when I hear it, but I've forgotten it. Thank you. That's what it is. 455 kilohertz. Okay. Now, um, uh, give me an AM radio station. What is it? 1280? Isn't that, that's AM radio, right? Okay. So what would the local oscillator frequency be in order to translate the 1280 to the 455? It, it could be the, the difference, right? What is that? Uh, 825? No, that's not right, is it? Two and eight would give me zero. What is uh, ten set two? Okay, eight twenty five, sorry. Eight twenty five, and what's the other one? Okay. So this would be low side. And this would be high side. Okay. Either one could be used. Okay. We'll see actually in AM radio, you typically use high side conversion. Okay. But now here's, here's a different problem. So let's say in AM radio, we're, we're trying to listen to 1280 kilohertz. So the local oscillator frequency would be set to 1735 to produce the 455 kilohertz. Okay. There's another input frequency when mixed with 1735 would also give you 455. The 1280 is the difference between these two. What's the sum of the two? What is it? 2190 kilohertz? Okay. So, the 1280 station mixed with 1735 gives me 455. But if there were another radio station at 2190, when it's mixed with 1735, it would also be translated to the same 455. Okay. And then here's, here's where we have our envelope detector. Okay. There would actually be no way to eliminate the 2190, okay, unless I had some filter here. Okay. This is called the image of that carrier frequency. It's called the image station. You would hear both of them. So here's, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here about how, how super heterodyne receivers work. In an AM radio receiver, it's not, you're, you're not adjusting a bandpass filter to pick up the different stations. You're actually adjusting the frequency of your local oscillator. Okay. So, for 1280, we use 1735. Okay. Another radio station in the AM band, uh, 680. Okay. So now what would our local oscillator have to be tuned to? Again, two choices. Uh, the sum, which would be what, five, three, 1135 kilohertz. Okay. Again, that would be the high side frequency. Okay. The low side frequency would be the difference, 200. 
but you know, once you've made the decision to do high side, all, you, all of them would be high side here because now what you have is you're changing the frequency of this local oscillator. Okay. Notice <laughs> by changing the local oscillator frequency here, depending on what radio station I'm listening to, they're all tuned to the same, this is called the intermediate frequency. Okay. Um, this is always the same. I just changed the frequency of this oscillator and all my radio stations get mixed to that same intermediate frequency, the 455 kilohertz. So my envelope detector only has to work at that one frequency. Actually, it's typically preceded by a bandpass filter, but now that bandpass filter doesn't have to be adjustable either. It just has to work at the 455 kilohertz. Okay. So we'll, that, that's all for today. Um, we'll continue to look at this, especially I think next time we'll, we'll, I'll show you the full blown super heterodyne receiver. But if you understand this part, you're well on your way to understanding the super heterodyne technique. Same technique is used for FM radio and television and essentially almost all modern communication receivers use this technique of mixing the carrier to an intermediate frequency and then demodulating that intermediate frequency instead of directly demodulating at the carrier frequency. So. Instead of, instead of actually bandpass filtering around the actual frequency? Uh, a direct conversion to baseband. That is possible. You can do that for a synchronous receiver, but our AM radio is not a synchronous receiver, right? <clears throat> For a synchronous receiver, you have to be exactly matched to the carrier frequency. This doesn't require that. I don't have to be exactly matched to the carrier. I'm doing envelope detection here. This is still an asynchronous receiver. This can be off a few tens of kilohertz. Doesn't matter, I'm still doing envelope detection. I don't have to, to do direct conversion. I have to be matched to the carrier frequency in frequency and phase. Yeah, doesn't matter because this is still an asynchronous receiver. There's no direct correlation between these two.